Tammy from History Hiccups here. Today we're going to be talking about the 1811 to 1812 New Madrid fault line earthquakes. <clears throat> and I'm going to be showing you some photos of um, our area where they come through. And we call it the bluff. Because uh, when the earthqu earthquakes came through, um, it split open the mountain and we've got some pretty scenery down there and I'll just show you pictures and stuff, but that's what we're going to be talking about today. So stay. 1811 to 1812 New Madrid earthquakes. In 1811 and 1812, Alabama was part of the Mississippi Territory and Alabama didn't become a state until 1819. The New Madrid fault line stretches 150 miles, crossing parts of Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri, and Tennessee, centered on the town of New, New Madrid. Scientists say they believe there is a 7 to 10% chance of a 7.7 .7 or higher magnitude earthquake similar in strength to the ones that struck in 1811 and 1812 within the New Madrid seismic zone in the next 50 years. There is a 25% to 45% chance of a 6.0 uh, magnitude or greater earthquake striking in that time. And the information I got from this was written in January 2020. So these are strange happenings during the earthquakes. The New Madrid earthquakes were the biggest earthquakes in American history. They, they occurred in the central Mississippi Valley, but were felt as far away as New York City, Boston, Montreal, Washington, DC, and Washington, D.C. President James Madison and his wife Dolly felt them in the White House. Church bells rang in Boston from December 16, uh, 1811 through March of 1812. There were over 2,000 earthquakes in the central Midwest and between 6,000 and 10,000 earthquakes in the Boot Hill, Missouri, where New Madrid was located near the junction of Ohio and Mississippi River. In the known history of the world, no other earthquakes have lasted so long or produced so much evidence of damage as the New Madrid earthquakes. Three of the earthquakes are on the list of America's top earthquakes. The first one on December 16, 1811, a magnitude of 8.1 on the Richter scale. The second on January 23rd, 1812 at 7.8. And on the 3rd of February 7th, on the third, the third earthquake on February 7th, 1812 at as much as 8.8 .8 magnitude. <clears throat> the Mississippi ran backwards. After the February 7th earthquake, Boatman reported that the Mississippi actually ran backwards for several hours. The force of the land upheaval 15 miles south of New Madrid created Real Foot Lake, drowned the inhabitants of an old Indian village, turned the river against itself to flow backwards, devastated thousands of acres of virgin forest, and created two temporary waterfalls in the Mississippi. Boatmen on the flatboat, on flatboats actually survived this experience and lived to tell the tale. Getting over cracks. As the general area experienced more than 2,000 earthquakes in five months, people discovered that most of, most of the crevices opening up during the, an earthquake ran from north to south. And when the earth began moving, they would chop down trees in the east-west direction and hold on using the tree as a bridge. These were missing people who were most likely swallowed up by the earth 
Some earthquake fissures were as long as five miles. <clears throat> earthquake a phenomenon, sand bowls. The world's largest sand bowl was created by the New Madrid earthquake. It is 1.4 miles long and 136 acres in extent. Located in the boot hill of Missouri, about eight miles west of Haiti, Missouri, a locals call it the beach. Other small, much smaller sand bowls are found throughout the area. Seismic T-bar, tar bars. Small pallets up to golf ball sized tar balls were found in sand bowls and fissures. They, were, they are petroleum that has been solidified or petroleum ferrous nodules. Hmm. Earthquake lights. Lights flash from the ground caused by quartz crystals being squeezed. The phenomenon is called seismolamination. Uh, I don't know that word. S E I S M O L U M I N E S C E N C E. Whatever that word is. Okay. Warm water. Water thrown up by an earthquake was lukewarm. It is speculated that the shaking caused the water to heat up and or the uh, quartz lighted, light heated, heated the water. Quartz light heated the water. Earthquake smog. The skies turned dark during the earthquakes. So dark that lighted lamps didn't help. The air smelled bad and it was hard to breathe. It is speculated that it was smog containing dust particles caused by the eruption of warm water into cold air. Loud thunder, sounds of distant thunder and explosions accompanied the earthquakes. Animal warnings. People reported <clears throat> strange behavior by animals before the earthquakes. They were nervous and excited. Domestic animals became wild and wild animals became tame. Snakes came out of the ground from hibernation. Flocks of ducks and geese landed near people. And this is the um, uh, Tecumseh's Comet and the Battle of Tippecanoe. The uh, earthquakes were preceded by the appearance of a great comet which was visible around the globe for 17 months, and it was at its brightest during the earthquakes. The comet, with an orbit of 3,065 years, was last seen during the time of Ramses II in Egypt. In 1811 to 1812, it was called Tecumseh's Comet, or Napoleon's Comet in Europe. Tecumseh was a Shawnee Indian leader whose name meant shooting star, or he walks across the sky. He was given this name at birth, a great orator and military leader. Tecumseh organized a confederation of Indian tribes to oppose the takeover of three million acres of Indian lands, which were obtained by the Treaty of Fort, Will Fort Wayne in 1809. His brother, a religious leader called the Prophet, had gained fame when he foretold the total eclipse of the sun on June 16, excuse me, June 16, 1806. They had learned about it in advance from a team visiting, a team visiting astronomers. During this time, the governor of Indiana Territory William Henry Harrison warned about, worried about the prophet's popularity, um, had challenged him to produce a miracle. After the day of the black sun, the brothers had no trouble attracting followers. A black sun was said to predict a future war. On September 17, 1811, there was another solar eclipse which again was predicted by the prophet. 
the Brothers Center of Operations was at Prophetstown, located near the junction of the Wabash and Tippecanoe Rivers in northern Indiana. Tecumseh was traveling and recruited warriors among the southeastern tribes when Governor Harrison attacked Prophetstown with over a thousand men on November 6, 1811, a preemptive strike by the U.S., which marked the beginning of Tecumseh's war. On December 16th, when the earthquakes began, Tecumseh was at the Shawnee and Delaware Indian villages near Cape Girardeau, 50 miles north of the, of the epicenter at New Madrid. The earthquakes continued as he traveled to Prophetstown, arriving there at February 8, 1812. Tecumseh's followers lost the Battle of Tippecanoe, but they continued to fight as allies of the British during the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain. Tecumseh was killed in the battle in Canada in 1813. He is honored as one of the greatest of Indian leaders, both in the United States and in Canada, where he is considered a national hero. The first steamboat on the western waters survived the earthquakes. The steamboat traveled, the first steamboat travel on the Ohio-Mississippi rivers took place during the New Madrid earthquakes. The New Orleans set out from Pittsburgh on October 20th, 1811, bound for New Orleans. Captain Nicholas Roosevelt had brought along his young wife, their two-year-old daughter, and a Labrador dog. Ten days after leaving Pittsburgh, his wife Lydia gave birth to a son in Louisville, Kentucky. They waited a while for her to recover and for the water to rise prior to crossing the dangerous river waters and coral reef at the falls of the Ohio. On the night before the day of the earthquake, December 16th, the steamboat was anchored near Owensboro, Kentucky, about 200 miles east of New Madrid, Missouri. Their dog, Tiger, insisted on staying in the cabin with them instead of sleeping on the deck. Without realizing it, they headed straight towards the epicenter of the greatest earthquake in American history. Their steamboat, intended to be an advertisement for steam travel, was thought instead to be the cause of the earthquake by many who saw it. At Henderson, Kentucky, where no chimneys, no chimneys were left standing, they stopped to visit their friends. The painter John James Abdom, uh, Abdon, and his wife Lucy, floating in the middle of the Ohio River, they were protected from the earthquake tremors shaking the land, but not from the hazards of falling trees, disappearing islands, and collapsing river banks. After entering Indian Territory on December 18th, they were chased by Indians who figured the fire canoe had caused the earthquake, but they managed to escape, capture by outrun, escape capture by outrunning them. They even had a small cabin fire that night, which they managed to put out. Thousands of trees were floating on the waters. Uh, well, I lost my place. Oh, darn it. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, here we go. Thousands of trees were floating on the water, waters of the Mississippi. As they approached New Madrid on December 19th, three days after the earthquake, they found that the town of New Madrid had been destroyed. They didn't dare to stop and pick up a few, few survivors for fear of being overrun, and they were without supplies. Most alarming was the fact that they had not seen a boat ascending the river in three days. They saw wrecked and abandoned boats. It was undoubtedly a miracle that they survived and kept on going. They, tried, they tied up at one island, and the island sank during the night. Their dog, Tiger, 
alerted them to oncoming tremors. On December 22nd, they encountered the British nationalist John Bradbury on a boat at the mouth of the St. Francis River who told them of the town of Big Prairie was gone, that the town of Big Prairie was gone. They arrived at Natchez, Mississippi on December 30th and celebrated the first marriage aboard a steamship on December 31st when the steamboat engineer married Lydia's maid. They arrived at New Orleans on January 10th, 1812, safe and sound after traveling 1,900 miles from Pittsburgh on the first steamboat to travel the western waters. Well, hope you all enjoyed that, and um, see you back soon. Bye.